Uh, and I am the rabbi emeritus. Yeah. Rabbi emeritus. And I was the rabbi here um, since August 1, and August 1, 1970. And our first babysitter was Rose. <laughs> That's right. We came with three children, and we left with seven children. Thank God. So I'm happy to welcome all your smiling faces. And uh, so this synagogue, um, the first minion of this synagogue, occurred in right around now, this time of year. In fact, it was these parshiot of the week, Achrimos Kedoshim, Emor, and it was, uh, the first minion was established in 1852 by Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Margolis Levin. And uh, his great-great-grandson is Dr. Michael Kogan, who comes here every summer. He's a professor of religion. Um, and we'll talk about him. But in any event, in um, 1852, there were enough Yiddish-speaking Jews from Eastern Europe uh, who did not feel comfortable uh, in the Sephardic Orthodox Synagogue, Sherith Israel, which broke off from KKBE because of the organ controversy. And they wanted to have their own Ashkenazic minion, Nusach Ashkenaz. So this uh, rabbi, and he was a rabbi, this man was really a rabbi. He had learned in a yeshiva in Slobodka in Eastern Europe. Uh, there were very few rabbis in America from the beginning. For example, in Charleston, there was no rabbi from 1695 until um, the latter part of the 19th century. Like Gustav Fuznansky in KKB was not a rabbi. He was a cantor a moel and a shochit, but he was not a rabbi. This man actually had smicha, and he came from an Eastern European yeshiva, which was a very uh, well-thought-of yeshiva in Slobodka, Lithuania. And um, he came because he had a, uh, a brother-in-law who was living, living here. And when he came to America, brother-in-law and a sister and a family, when he came to America, he thought he would find no Hebrew books, no uh, books of Jewish scholarship, like the Talmud, like the Shulchan Aruch, et cetera, all of those books. He did not think he would find them here. So before he left Europe, he sat down and he made for himself a rabbinic guide, rabbinic guide, which he wrote in Hebrew. And in this rabbinic guide, he wrote down the laws of shechita, how to slaughter an animal. He, he wrote down the laws of chalitza, which is if a woman gets married to a man and he dies and uh, he's supposed to marry the brother-in-law, we don't do that anymore, so you have to have a ceremony called chalitza. He wrote down the laws of uh, marriage, of divorce, all the practical things that he thought he would need in America. And he brought with him that guide, and he founded the Minion. He was able to find uh, over 10 Eastern European Jews. And what he did after Shabbat, after Motzei Shabbat, after Saturday night, he would write down the names of the people who attended. So we have exactly the names of the people who attended that Minyan. And one of them was actually Reda's ancestor. He, would, he attended that. We have all the names of the 10 or 11, and he gives you also how much money they pledged. <laughs> some pledged a nickel, some pledged a dime. So this is uh, how the first uh, beginnings of this synagogue. However, in the summer of 1852, uh, he, was, he tried to go into business here uh, he tried to go with his brother-in-law to a shirtwaist factory for women, but it, it didn't go, and so he, he had to go up to where his brother-in-law was uh, in northern South Carolina. 
But that started the spark. Then in 1854, by the way, we have that Madrich, that rabbinic guide that he wrote. Michael Kogan got it from his great aunt. He brought it down to College of Charleston, and he gave it to Dale Rosengarten. He's going to meet tomorrow, who is the director of the archives, the Jewish archives at the library, the Alastone Library of uh, the College of Charleston. So one, one morning in 2001, Dale uh, calls me up. She says, I have something here that you might find interesting. So she comes over to my office, and she said, this is what Michael Kogan gave me. Can you translate it? So I was the first person to read it since 1852. So I translated into English. I did it on tape for the college. So it's in the archives of the college. And I have a copy of it. I made a copy of it. Very interesting book. But historically, what is important is the list of people who attended the Mignonim. Because then we know who was here in Charleston at that time in 1852. Then in 1854, we had another group of Jews, the same group plus others, including the Jacobs, the Jacobs family, who were also the Pearlstein family. The Pearlsteins and the Jacobs were the same family. And they also were part of this shul, this beginning of the shul. And um, they had services uh, at Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur in um, 1854. And they rented a storefront on King Street, and that's where they began. Uh, and then we have um, that they actually incorporated as a synagogue. And what was the first thing that they did? They bought a cemetery. And the cemetery they bought is up here in the in, uh, northern part of Meeting Street. Uh, that's the, there is a cemetery, the Brishalom Cemetery. And the first grave there was uh, from 1856. So we know we have written and stowed how old the synagogue at least. 1856, and happened to be a young man, uh, 18 years old, uh, who drowned. And his uh, tombstone was all in Hebrew. And when I went out there with Dale, we went out on a project to try to photograph some of the old stones out there. And it could still be read. And the second man who was buried there was the president, Eisenbahn. He was the, he was the second one. To, they had a lot of yellow fever in, in Charleston, just like they had in Memphis. They killed almost a third of the city of Memphis in the 1870s. But here in um, Charleston, they had it all the time. They used to think in August, there was this, they called it the, the time of sickness or uh, fever because of the mosquitoes, etc. But anyway, so that's how Brish Shalom started, with Eastern European, um, Eastern European Yiddish-speaking Jews. And uh, in the book that we have here that was written by uh, Professor Dr. Jeffrey Gurak on the 150th anniversary of the shul in, in 2004, so he will show you the list of uh, the original founders of the shul. And you can see on the windows. You can see on the windows. You see Karish, old family. Ellison's old family. Livingstein, old family. Right, We're very long standing families of the original group. And so then you had more Eastern European Jews coming. But of course, um, what happened in 1861, well, you had first the, the uh, state of South Carolina seceded from the Union. They seceded from the Union according to the Articles of Secession because uh, when Abraham Lincoln was elected president, he said he will not allow slavery to spread to the territory. He will not abolish slavery at that moment, but he will not allow slavery to go into the territories that would become states. So the people of the South said, well, if you're not going to allow 
new states to have slavery, that means as soon as we have more new states out in the West that abolish slavery, then pretty soon there'll be an absolute majority in the Senate of states against slavery, and they will abolish it. So they decided they would secede, right? They would secede. So uh, there was once, there was a man here in, in Charleston, of the old families uh, of the original settlers. I think his name was Pettigrew. So he was one of the few who opposed secession. Now actually this other, this Jewish man that we saw at his house, he also opposed secession. But there were very few who opposed secession. Charleston was filled with hotheads who wanted to secede and wanted to fight. So um, Pettigrew said, the state of South Carolina is too small to be a country, and it's too large to be an insane asylum. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's what happened. So what happened during the Civil War in Charleston? Well, Charleston suffered terribly. They suffered terribly. They thought that they would be burned down by Sherman when it came up from uh, Savannah. So they shipped everything from KKBE, as Zaretta mentioned, to Columbia. Sherman did not burn Charleston. Why? Well, he had been stationed at uh, Fort Moultrie, and I, <laughs> so maybe he decided he, whatever, he didn't burn Charleston. What did he burn? Columbia. So all the things from, um, so, all, all the material that KKBE sent up there was burned and destroyed. So this Michael Kogan, who is uh, this descendant of the uh, original rabbi of, of this synagogue, he was not an official rabbi, but he was the one who formed the first minion. So he told, he told me this story. He said his ancestors uh, ran away from Charleston up to Columbia with their slaves as well. They had slaves. And... Um, so uh, they, they had a house in Columbia, and he wants to prove that the North, the Yankees, really wanted to destroy Columbia, burn it down. And it wasn't just that the Southerners, the Confederates, were burning it as a rear action. So he said, no, no, they wanted to burn it down. And I have proof. So what's the proof? He said, well, my family was sitting there on a Friday night, having a Shabbos meal in Columbia, South Carolina. And Sherman's army had come up, and there was a knock on the door, and there was a Yankee soldier there. And they said, oh, would you like to come and join us? He said, fine, I'll come and have the meal. He had the meal. Then he said, I'm sorry, people, but I have to burn down your house. I have orders. So actually it was a black slave who um, had the sense in the in presence of mine, that she took all the silverware, everything they had of, of value that they brought from Charleston, wrapped it in a tablecloth, and put it down a well to hide it from the soldiers. That's what he said. And after they left and the house was burned down, they went back and they got their stuff. And he showed me the Hanukkah menorah that they had from that time. He said, yeah, that was it his. That's his story, anyway. Any event, um, to go back to the history here of this synagogue, um, Sheriff Israel could not withstand the war. That was the Sephardic Orthodox synagogue. They could not uh, withstand it. Um, KKBE uh, was very uh, severely damaged, and there was also a lot of people left. So basically, whoever was left after the Civil War of Sheriff Israel, if they wanted to go Orthodox, they came into Bris Shalom. If they wanted to go back to KKBE, they went back to KKBE. The, the building, by the way, of Sheriff Israel still stands. I think it's owned by the Catholic Church today, south of Meeting, right? Right, or west, or, or huh? On Wentworth. On Wentworth. Oh, right by where we were, yeah. So then... Um, <clears throat> So what happened after, but this shul, well, the, this shul there was a, it was able to thrive after the war because you had immigrants coming from Eastern Europe. 
And I'll tell you an interesting story that uh, was told to me by Melvin and Isaac Jacobs, Aleya Mashalom, if you remember. So they were old timer. The Jacobs were the first people who were in that list. So a man and his son came. They came in, um, in 1852. They came to Charleston. And the, why did the, the, the son came? Because the czar was drafting all the Jewish men. He wanted to get out of the army. He didn't want to go into the Russian army, which was an anti-Semitic army. So he came to America. So they were peddlers, and they were doing all right. They brought the rest of the family, the Pearlsteins and others. And then uh, the Civil War came. He didn't want to go in the Confederate Army. He didn't want to go to any army. You know? So he got on a train, and he went to Cincinnati. That's where the train ended. And he lived in Cincinnati, and he was drafted into the Northern Army. So, <laughs> but after the war, he came back, and he was a peddler. He used to go to the little towns around, and they used to call him Jew Jacobs. And that was... Uh, any event, uh, so the immigrants started coming uh, from Eastern Europe. And of course, the major uh, tide of immigration came after the May Laws of 1881 in Russia. And that's when um, Tsar Alexander II was assassinated by a group of anarchists. And among those anarchists was a Jewish girl. And so... Uh, his son, Alexander III, decided he's going to <clears throat> take a revenge against the Jews. So he passed these terrible anti-Semitic laws in 1881, depriving Jews of their livelihood. He actually stated that he was going back to the plan of his grandfather, Nicholas I, who said, we're going to get rid of the Jews by converting a third of them and by um, starving a third of them and making a third of them immigrate. So that's what they're trying to do. So he passed these laws authorizing pogroms, right? Riots against the Jews, these laws. And uh, he drafted people in the army and he did all sorts of terrible things. So then the Jews started to come. They came from 1881 to 1924 from the Tsarist Empire and other parts of Europe, probably three million Jews came to America. Not all of them came to Charleston. Right? Uh, very few came to Charleston. But there were some from Lithuania who came. Uh, and they, then they came also from a little shtetl south of Warsaw called Kalashin. Now, the ones from Lithuania, so they were misnagdim. They were not Hasidim. The ones from Kalashin, some of them were Hasidim, had Hasidic uh, roots. So, yeah, like the Zuckers, uh, the Kirstins, the Sokols, all of these major families of the shul. So, um, they came, and there were many times, um, uh, let's say, attempts to break off from the major shul. In 1886, there was a break-off of the shul. And actually, I discussed with Saul Brebart about this break-off many times. He was trying to find if there was any uh, evidence in the papers, the newspapers of the time. But we know that they broke off. How do we know they broke off? Because they made their own cemetery. And the cemetery is in Maryville, across the bridge. So that's the cemetery that we primarily use today. So we have a cemetery in uh, Magnolia, up on in the northern part of the city, and then across the bridge. Now, they came back into the shul. They didn't last long. But unfortunately, that happens to be a southern tradition to secede whenever you have a problem, right? So then, um, what happened after that? Um, the shul grew. People came from Kalashin, one after the other. The Foxes, the Zuckers, and all the Sokols, and all the others came. And uh, the Kirstins, and they had their own customs. And the people who had come in the 1850s, by 1880, 1890, they had already Americanized. They Americanized. So, though every rabbi that this shul had was a Yiddish-speaking rabbi, 
until 1927. Rabbi Axman came. He was the first one who was English-speaking, who gave the drusha in English. Then after him, you had Rabbi Axelman, who stayed from 1927 to uh, 1944, so uh, 17 years. After him, uh, then you had Rabbi, uh, uh, you had a, a rabbi who attempted to be conservative. Um, and then after him, you had Rabbi Gilbert Clapperman. After Gilbert Clapperman, you had Rabbi uh, Rothstein. After Rabbi Rothstein, you had Rabbi Rabinovich. After Rabbi Rabinovich, you had Rabbi Galinsky. After Rabbi, Rabbi Galinsky, you had me. And uh, I served the longest of any rabbi in this synagogue, 34 years. So, um, but what happened when you had this conflict of people who are Americanized, so, and then people just came from Europe, some people who had customs of Lithuania and not Hasidic, and some people have Hasidic. So they, they find, well, I'll show you pictures down below and you'll see uh, the difference of what happened. But in 1911, a group of the Kalashiners primarily, though not all of them, Abe Kirstein did not leave and others did not leave, uh, decided they make their own shul. They called it Beth Israel. And they had a little building on St. Philip Street. I'm sure, Bill, you remember that. And, they, and so you had two Orthodox synagogues, and you had KKBE, the uh, Reformed Temple, in Charleston. And that's the way it was. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you had a lot of problems uh, in the world. You had a depression. Uh, you had, first, you had the First World War. You had a depression. A lot of people came right after the First World War from Kalashin specifically, because of the, terrible, uh, the terrible persecutions that occurred after the First World War. Then you had the Depression, and people were very poor, very poor. Mrs. Fox, Allah Shalom, used to tell me that uh, she was lucky to get a soup bone for Shabbos. She would go to the butcher, and he would give her a soup bone. I mean, they were very poor. The whole town was poor. That's why they didn't knock down these buildings. They didn't have money to knock them down. They were poor, very poor. From the Civil War to the Second World War, Charleston was poor. <clears throat> Baba Zucker, all of us shalom, told me uh, that, uh, oh, oh, this came off, sorry. I'll put it back on. Sorry, excuse me here. So Baba Zucker told me um, that his father bought one of those beautiful mansions on the Battery. He paid $17,000 for it. Today, what's it, $8 million, $10 million? Because nobody wanted them. Why did they not want them? Well, because look how high the ceiling is. And when you, to heat it, cost a fortune. Unless you had a fireplace. Now, but even so, the fireplace didn't do that good. And then when the air conditioning came in, to air condition those places cost you a fortune. So therefore, they moved up near the Citadel, and they built these little houses, which were actually against the code. They were almost on the ground. But they were little houses. You could eat them, and you could heat them, and you can air condition them much, with much less money. So um, what happened, though, in, uh, after or in, during this, the Second World War, as far as the Jewish community, we had a, the president of um, British Shalom was Ed Kronzberg. Ed Kronzberg uh, had, came from Baltimore. And he set up uh, five and dime stores, Ed stores, all over the state. And he became one of the wealthiest Jews in Charleston. So. Um, he wanted to make Brishalom conservative. That was his idea. So um, Rabbi Axelman, who had been serving since 1927, he asked the synagogue, you know, I was willing to do all this work for almost nothing during the Depression. He was actually the rabbi of both synagogues, Brishalom and Beth Israel, and the Talmud Torah and everything. He did everything. He said he wanted a raise. And the board, in its wisdom, said no. 
So he said, okay, I'm leaving. So he left, right during the Second World War. So um, Ed Kronberg thought, well, now I can bring in a conservative rabbi. So I think he brought in Rabbi Weintraub at that time. Is that what his name? Weintraub? Yeah. So, so he did not, he said, listen, it's the war time. It costs money to, to travel, to bring in somebody from New York. Let me go up at my own expense and I'll get the rabbi. So the board said, fine, go up and get you. So he goes up and he doesn't go to Yeshiva University Orthodox. He goes to the conservative, uh, JTS. And he finds a rabbi, a conservative rabbi. He brings him down. Weintraub was his name. So uh, something like that. Huh? Oh, Goldfarb. Goldfarb. Weintraub was somebody else. Goldfarb. You're right, Goldfarb. So he comes down, and um, the people could see he's not orthodox. Especially, you had people here from Europe who were very well-learned people. I mean, these were European people who studied the yeshivas in Europe. Abe Kirstein studied with Rab Chaim Salavechik. You had Alta Kirstein. You had Shaya Slachever, who studied in Yushalayim and Eitz Chaim. I mean, these people knew Talmud back and, back with the fall. And to come down and to bring a rabbi, they saw why the way he wasn't orthodox. So that was a big hubbub, what to do. So uh, he served for three years to 47. And then, um, so at that time, uh, he, they decided they would not renew his contract. So then uh, Ed Crowns had brought up the fact, well, perhaps we should make it conservative anyway. And there was a very close vote, but they voted against it. Some of the people that I used to visit in the hospital were very proud. I voted against it. <laughs> so they voted against it. And so they put in the contract, they put in the Constitution, the next rabbi has to be approved by Dr. Samuel Belkin, the president of Yeshiva University. So uh, Dr. Samuel Belkin, in 1948, uh, he suggested Rabbi Gilbert Klapperman who was a, a major rabbinic star of uh, Yeshiva University, who came, and he's still living. He's 94 years old. I saw him last year. He has come down here on many occasions, Gilbert Klapperman. Gilbert Klapperman was the rabbi of Brishalom from 1947 to um, 1950. And uh, he told me that was the best time of his rabbinic career. He and his wife, Libby. His wife wrote uh, history books for children and children, Jewish children's books. You remember those, Rose? Unfortunately, she had a heart condition and she, um, it was hard for her here. And so she had good care. Dr. Coleman, I think, took care of her. But, um, so they, uh, in 1950, they left and they went up to Lawrence, Long Island, where they stayed until he retired. And now he's Rabbi Emeritus there in the Beth uh, Israel of uh, Lawrence Long, uh, Long Island. So, um, so now you had two Orthodox shuls and a um, Reformed temple. And by the way, they didn't have much to do with each other in those days. They didn't have much to do. There were different plateaus. So Ed Kronzberg and a group of his friends decided we're going to make a conservative shul. So in 1947, they pulled out members from, uh, from Brishalom and Beth Israel, and they made a conservative shul. So there were four synagogues at that time. And um, so four synagogues in Charleston. So that was Synagogue Emmanuel. And they, and they bought an old army chapel. They put it over here near the citadel in the northern part of the city. And then that was Synagogue Emanuel. So they started in 1947. So meanwhile, people were saying, well, listen, uh, we lost members to the conservatives. Should we still have two Orthodox? Maybe we should combine. And that was a very big controversy to combine. I'm, I'm sure Bill remembers it. Very big controversy, should they combine. They had a rabbi and a cantor at Beth Israel. And they had a rabbi and a cantor in Brishalom. Now, Brishalom in those days was on St. Philip Street. 
Now, as you pointed out, that's now part of the College of Charleston. You can't see the building. Just like you can't see my house anymore. 74 Montague is now a parking lot for Miss Masons. Have you seen it? Couldn't, you can't see that one. Then this shul was built by Beth Israel because people of Beth Israel, who are the Kalashina Jews, or the Jews from that type, uh, they did well in the Second World War. So Morris Sokol and a few others built this building. This building was built in 1947. You could go outside and you'll see the original building committee. And uh, it did not have the balconies that have now. It had the back balconies, but not these balconies. You see right now we have two, we have actually four sections for women. This balcony, that balcony, that balcony, and down over here. Right over here is also a section for women. This is a new mechitza that we put in about the year 2000 or so. So uh, we've also uh, made the shul a little bit more airy. Uh, well, that happened after, even after I left. But basically, they were discussing how to merge the two Orthodox synagogues, Beth Israel and Brisholem, and there was a lot of fighting going on backwards and forwards, backwards and forward. The rabbi at that time, I believe, in um, Beth Israel, was a rabbi who later on went to Columbus, Ohio. Do you remember his name? Yeah, he was, and then the rabbi here was Gilbert Clapperman, and then Rabbi Rothstein, then there was a Rabbi Tuckman. That's it, Rabbi Rubenstein. You got it. Rabbi Rubenstein was the rabbi here in, in uh, Beth Israel. Finally, in 1954, they had enough discussions that they're going to merge. And they're going to sell that building down on St. Philip Street and move here and bring the balconies from the old building and the stained glass windows. Now, the tops of the windows were designed by Rabbi Eliezer, Nochem Eliezer Rabinovich. All the tribes are up on top of the window. He took all the insignia from uh, Mid the Midrash, Mos Rabbah, and he put it up there. He designed it. And who was in charge of the building to put it all together? Bill Feldman. He was in charge. He was also in charge of building the house on 74 Montague Street. So he used to tell me all the time that after he finished this, this structure the way it is now, so he said he came to shul one day and there was an old European lady comes and she says, this is not a shul, this is a base hamigdash. Right? This is not a shul, this is the temple in Jerusalem. She was very impressed. So uh, after a lot of acrimony, they finally merged. And um, they had to get rid of the rabbis. So Rabbi Rothstein from here, uh, was let go. Rabbi Rubenstein was let go. The cantor, they had a very good cantor in Beth, uh, Beth Israel, Rabbi uh, Cantor Lieber, who was a good cantor and he was a good moil. Uh, he moved to New Jersey. His son teaches my grandson right now. Yep. yep. You know him? Remember him? Yes, he was in my class. He's in your class. Teaches my grandson, Harry, in, uh, in the Hebrew Academy of Long Beach. Small world, huh? So, and, and he tells uh, my grandson about his life in Charleston. And at the same time, Moshe Koenig, the other cantor's Yes, Moshe Koenig, who lives in Balea Dumim now, right? So they kept uh, Cantor Koenig, uh, who was a Holocaust survivor. They had a Shamish, Reverend Gutman, a Holocaust survivor. And they brought in a new rabbi, a young man who had just got his smicha from uh, the yeshiva near Israel in Baltimore, Rabbi Nocham Eliezer Rabinovich, who was a, a very brilliant man, who is a very brilliant man, very brilliant man. He came, he has um, a PhD in mathematics. Uh, he's, he's a tremendous Talmudic scholar, a tremendous writer, a tremendous orator, writes uh, rabbinic uh, responsa all the time. And so he stayed here, and he's the one who really forced the merger. In fact, there was a synagogue meeting up here, uh, a little boisterous. We had the boisterous meetings. Don't tell anybody, but we have boisterous meetings. So he gets up and he says, if we, he goes over to this Aaron Kodesh, 
and he opens up the Orange Kodesh, and he says, you're in front of a Sifrei Torah. Do the right thing. Merge. And they merged. <clears throat> but they still had a lot of problems. So um, he also said, he came, I'm, I'm only staying if there's a day school. So he founded the day school. The day school, the Charleston Hebrew Institute, which, which was a, the educational arm of this, uh, of this shul, this synagogue. He also set uh, the standards of kashrus throughout the whole city. Rose's mother was his uh, secretary, and she was my secretary afterwards, Rabbi Galinsky's secretary. So um, he was a tremendous force for Orthodox Judaism in Charleston. A man of tremendous prestige, ability. He was here from 1954 to 1963, nine years. Then he went from here to Toronto. Then he went from Toronto to, to London, England, where he became the Dean of Jews College, the Rabbinic Seminary of, of England. And uh, then he left there, and he's head of the yeshiva in Malay Adumim, uh, which is a settlement, uh, if you've been to Israel. It's a, a yeshivat is there. That means the boys go in the army. And he's been the head of that yeshiva, and he's a tre tremendous, uh, tremendous leader of Judaism today. He's about, I would say, 87 years old, still head of the yeshiva. And we have a fellow from uh, his yeshiva comes to collect money for it. You know him, Rabbi Groner? He comes. He used to be in New Orleans, or he was in Burnham. He was born in New Orleans. He lived in... Um, in New York afterwards. So, um, so Rabbi Rabinovich really set the tone for Orthodox Judaism in this city, as far as the day school. And who were the first teachers in the day school, the Hebrew teachers? Jerry Zucker's parents. That's amazing. Jerry Zucker's parents. So Jerry Zucker came from Israel at the age of three in 1956. And unfortunately, he died as a young man in his 50s. But he built an empire. So you know that his wife and his son are running the empire, Intertech. And I just saw in Forbes magazine last month that she is the richest woman, richest person in South Carolina. Her net worth is 2.6 billion. It's right there in Forbes. Yes. Well, see, he started from zero, from zero. I mean, his parents were Hebrew teachers. They, they probably didn't have enough money for food on the table. What? But they moved from here to Jacksonville, Florida, where they were teaching in that day school, and he went to the University of Florida. And he, he was a brilliant chemist. He developed uh, different uh, patents, 280 patents he had on different things, including the material for the astronaut's gloves. And, and from the, the, his um, ability in, in Jacksonville and in, in that type of uh, chemical industry, he saw an um, uh, opportunity in 1978 to come to Charleston and he took over a company called Intertech. And from that, he leveraged out into other businesses. Uh, he once um, owned almost all the factories that made non-woven fabric. That's the things that go into pampers, right? All those non-woven fabrics. He had factories all over the world. Then shortly before he died, he acquired the Hudson Bay Company of Canada the oldest department stores in Canada, the oldest, going back to the fur traders. And C, after he died tragically from a brain tumor, uh, so, she, so she took it over and her son took it over and they have kept going. So it's now 2.6 billion. It's right there in Forbes. So she, they did well in Charleston. Well, it wasn't just Charleston, but they used Charleston as a base. 
any event, that's the same Zucker family. Uh, that's why they came here, because of the Zuckers. They were related they were, uh, to the... Anyway, so to go back to what happened here in this shul, um, so the day school uh, has been going on since 1956. And uh, it has trained generations of young people. It goes up uh, from preschool to eighth grade, sometimes to ninth grade. Um, it has a very fine secular staff, has a very fine uh, Judaic staff. Uh, it was the educational arm of this synagogue for many, many years until uh, the conservative rabbi said he would be able to support it more if it would be independent. Well, first of all, he asked that it would be moved to the center. So it used to be located right behind the shul. Right behind the shul, this, that's where it was. From 1956 to 1986, it was right behind. It was adequate, there were nice, uh, the classrooms were okay. It only became air conditioned in 1976. Were you there before it was air conditioned? Sixty-four. And which I think was the first time girls were allowed on the paper. Really? First time. So then what happened, um, the conservative rabbi said he would support the school if it would move to the center. So Jerry Zucker came to us and he said, we had to, we had to refurbish those mobile classrooms behind. Because we put them in, in 1976 and 86, the fire department said you have to do something about them. So we either had to refurbish them, build a permanent building behind, that's the parking lot over here, or to move. So Jerry Zucker said, well, the center wants to expand, they wanted this. So he said, I think it'd be better for you to move to the center. Now whether or not that was a good move or a bad move, we moved to the center. So we, we moved to the center, we rented the space from the center for a dollar a year. But it hasn't been a happy marriage because there are a lot of different things, you know, getting two different organizations occupying similar space. So I understand they're now building a separate building. Is that right? It's basically grand from May 24th. It's entirely funded by the Zucker family. Funded by them, yeah. So there's going to be a separate building. That's a new development. All right, so then this Rabbi Cohen came to us. Uh, he said, uh, it would, he would give more support if we would make it a community school and not be part of BSBI officially. Though the rabbi of this shul has veto power over the Judaica faculty and the principal. That's in the Constitution. I hope they still keep to it. That's, that's a, so, so it became a community school. The Addison Hebrew Academy became a, hum, uh, a community school uh, about the year 2000. And uh, of course, it's still maintained by the shul in many ways. And uh, this is how um, <laughs> that developed. Uh, then, um, so we have the Adelstone. It became Adelstone because a man, by the same man who gave the money for the library, uh, he was convinced by uh, uh, Alvin Berlin to also give a donation to the school, and then it would be named after his parents. So it became the Adathot Hebrew Academy at that time in 1976. And we rededicated the building and put in air conditioning, et cetera. Then um, the community has developed. Uh, about 1968, a lot of people were moving from the Citadel area, which is north, to across the bridge to the place called South Windermere. And they started a branch of this synagogue there. And that branch has been in existence from 1968 till the present day. Uh, it was officially recognized by the shul probably about 1974, 75. So every Shabbos, this shul sponsors two separate services, one here downtown and one in South Windermere. Then, uh, after I left, I left in 2004, a group of young people who lived near the center 
Uh, they, they, would, they thought the shul should move from here, from downtown, since the majority of younger people who are Sabbath observant were living over there, that this shul should move over there. And there was a vote, and the vote was against moving. So then the people over there decided, OK, they will make their own branch. Unfortunately, the administration of the shul, the, the lay leadership, were not receptive. And so these people then broke off and made their new synagogue, Dor Tikva. So now again, you have two Orthodox synagogues in Charleston. Uh, though I want to tell you, the, there's been a lot of um, spiritual growth in Charleston, a lot of spiritual growth. When I first came to Charleston in 1970, August 1, 1970, I had been uh, the assistant rabbi in Atlanta, the rabbi Emanuel Feldman at Beth Jacob for two years. Before that, I was a chaplain in the United States Army in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, which they used to call Little Korea. And then I went to the regular Korea. I was in Korea, we camp Red, Red Cloud, Weejabu, South Korea. Uh, I was there from 1967 to 68. Any event, so, um, what happened here with, the, um, with this shul was um, in 1970, my best friends were my grandparents' age. My best friends. Who were the people living around the shul? My grandparents' age. There was Abe Kirstein, who was born in 1898. There was Alta Kirstein, born in 1900. There was Morris Sokol. There was Sarah Fox, born in 1903. They were my friends, because they were the Sabbath observant people in this neighborhood. And it's interesting, uh, because um, all my children were raised in Charleston. They were all raised in Charleston. 74 Montague Street, not one of the historical houses. It was more or less affordable, though it was on a swamp, and it did have a little mold in it. But it was a very, very happy house, a very happy. All my children loved Charleston. And when I um, told them, when I, yesterday, when I went by and I saw that the house doesn't exist anymore, uh, they were all very sad. They all loved Charleston. They would all come back to Charleston, not necessarily to live, but they had wonderful experiences here. Because the people, these elderly people, uh, treated them very well. And the fact that they were isolated from other people on Shabbos, other kids. So that means they were very close. Till this very day, they are extremely close, and we're very happy about that. So this last Pesach, I was at my son's house. Moshe lives in West Hempstead, uh, New York. He's an actuary, works for a Mercer Benefit Company, consultant for a benefit company. So what he does, oh, I'm sorry if I'm moving. I'm sorry, I don't mean to. So what he did, um, so the last days of Pesach, we had 21 people sleeping in the house. All our family. I mean, not all, just some of our family. Thank God we, we have uh, many, many grandchildren and one more on the way, which is great. So, um, and they love Charleston. So they would go to Mrs. Fox around the corner, and she, here's this lady, 75 years, 85 years, of, over the years. She would play checkers with them on Shabbos afternoon. The, I would walk home with Abe Kirstein and Mosey Resnick, so my best, our best friends were all these elderly people because they were the observant people in Charleston. When I left in 2004, some of my best friends were my children's age because they were the observant people, right? They were the observant people. So that's, that was a wonderful thing. That was a spiritual growth of this city. You thought that once these old Europeans would die, that orthodoxy would die. No, orthodoxy has had a tremendous resurgence, even in Charleston, even in Charleston. So, I mean, I probably in Charleston, I'm assuming, I was told by Rabbi Davies and Rabbi Davis, um, and I was told by Aaron Kirstein, who is going to school in Memphis, because we are in Memphis, I assume that's why he's in school, that's why his brother went there too. <coughs> And we have Shada Kirstein, who also in Memphis at our school because of that. So I was told by them 
that on, uh, on Pesach, you probably had in the three different services, probably 120 people at least. I don't think any other synagogue on Passover had 120 people on the days of Passover. So that's, I mean, so there's hope for Charleston, as far as I'm concerned. Hope for Charleston. And I was at the Minion this morning, and as you mentioned, five rabbis. <laughs> five rabbis at the Minion. Very good. So, in any event, um, there is, a lot of what I've told you is in the book, written by Dr. Jeffrey Gurak of Yeshiva University. A lot of it's there. And um, as far as I know now, uh, the administration of this synagogue uh, under Larry Haber is, is doing a very good job. I've been told he's doing a wonderful job. And there's a lot of programming and a lot of other things. Rabbi Davis is a very fine fellow, very fine. He used to be in Houston where he was good friends of my brother. And uh, Rabbi Davies seems like a very fine fellow. So, so that's a, a, that, from my point of view, that say, says a lot about Charleston. A lot about Charleston. So um, are there any questions? Anybody have anything? Yes. They were brought from the old shul. That's probably the way where they were in the old shul. See on the corner? Yeah. They were brought from the shul on St. Philip Street. We also had a chandelier. Remember the chandelier? But the, that was taken out. Uh, I don't know if Shirley Berlin liked it or she didn't like it or whatever it was. <laughs> she didn't like it. Yes? How many students in the day How many? Well, it varies from year to year. I was told there were about 135 right at the present. That's the preschool through eighth grade. All my children went to this day school. All of my children. Now, we didn't have a high school. Sometimes they had a ninth grade. So some of them went through to ninth grade. Uh, but we never had a full high school. Is, as an independent school, is it successful? I mean, how, did that, how does that work? Is it successful as far as? No, the two day schools didn't merge. It was always one school. But now it's a community school. A community school. Well, uh, again, we, we did that to, uh, to hope. Our hope was that uh, the conservative of the reform would support it more if it would not be officially connected to the Orthodox school. Unfortunately, that hope has not materialized. The, the conservative rabbi who said, I'll support you and everything else, if you do that, he never came through. So that's why some people say we should have stayed just with the synagogue. Uh, however, uh, the Jewish faculty are all uh, considered to be observant Jews. The, uh, the director now of the Judaic uh, department happens to be the Rebbitzin, Rabbi Davis's wife, Ariella. Rabbi Davies teaches in it. The conservative rabbi also teaches in it. And also, um, the, um, I believe the Rebbitzin, Rabbi Davies' wife, also teaches it. So uh, it, it has worked. It has worked. Uh, hopefully, it will continue. It depends upon how much uh, interest the orthodox element puts into it and how much they support it. But, but it has been a fine school. Look at Rose, right? It's been a fine school all the way through. All my children went to the school. They all had to go away to high school. All right, so what did they say? Uh, well, again, I'm moving, I'm sorry. I don't want to move out of the camera. So what did they say? Here's what they say. We took our daughter Tova, our oldest daughter, who is now 48 years old, thank God, Baruch Hashem. She has four children. Married to David Cooper. You in Memphis know about the Coopers. So, so we took her to New York for an interview for a New York, you know, Yeshiva High School for girls, right? So we took her to Prospect Park. So the teacher says, well, I see she has all A's. I see she's a wonderful student. But don't think she will do that in New York. <laughs> Guess what she did? 
she was the best student in her school. See, there's a lot of um, chutzpah, if you want to talk, a lot of arrogance of the northern school. All my children did extremely well, and they all went on to college. Uh, they all have uh, advanced degrees, except my youngest daughter, who is, has a very nice job without advanced degrees. But, uh, but they all did very well. And I give Charleston credit for a lot of them. Any rabbis? Any rabbis. Now, actually, not officially. I have five girls and two sons. Um, my oldest son went from here to the uh, yeshiva in Skokie, Illinois, based Medish to Torah, where he did very, very well. <clears throat> he left early admissions and he went to Israel to the uh, yeshiva Shalavim for two years. He was in Israel for two years. He came back to Yeshiva University, where he did very well there. And he went. After he finished college, he, he's an actuary. So he was taking the actuary test, and also he was studying in the rabbinic school. He finished everything in the, in the uh, rabbinic school. He passed all the tests except for the practical things you're supposed to do, like you're supposed to teach in a, a school for a while, you're supposed to do pastoral stuff. He was not interested in being a pulpit rabbi, but he wanted to have the knowledge. He has the knowledge. So to answer your question, he has the knowledge of a rabbi, most, better than most rabbis, but he is not officially a rabbi. Now my second son, so he went from here. He was going to go to Chicago, but my son-in-law's sister, Laurie Cooper, convinced him to come to Memphis, so he went to Memphis, Memphis High School, graduated. He also went early admissions to Israel to Gush, Yeshivat Haaretzion, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein. After that, he went to Yeshiva University, and he did very well there. And he then um, finished Yeshiva University. He went out to work in finance. He got his MBA from NYU. He went to Stern, you know, the Stern School of Business of NYU, named after Stern, too, not Stern College for Women. So he went to Stern, and um, he's, in a, in, he's an investment banker. He studies the daily page of Talmud that thousands of people study every single day. He studies it. And then on his Twitter account, he writes five comments every single day about his Talmudic studies. He does this on the Long Island Railroad on the way to work from Woodmere to Manhattan. So he started, he's sitting on that train studying Talmud. So does he have knowledge of a rabbi? Yes, he does. Tremendous knowledge. Is he a rabbi? No. He ha his wife is a CPA, and he, they have five, four lovely children. Four lovely children. Yes? I have a timing question, which is my problem. You explained it, but I forgot. First, I have an easy question. With all the balcony and that whole side, are there that many more ladies here than gentlemen? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, OK, we'll skip to we'll No, no, actually. The number of seats right now, you probably have more women seats than you have men seats. Uh, the originally, when you had just these balconies and you didn't have that, you had a little bit in the back for women. The reason we put this in, because uh, it was difficult for women to climb the steps. So we want to make it easier for them to climb the steps so they could have that. But actually, you're correct. There are more seats for women right now than there are for men. Yes. The middle 50s. Middle 50s. Yeah. Okay. And did it actually combine at one Yes. Time? That's why it's Brish Shalom Beth Israel. Okay, but it still had in the uh, Constitution that the rabbi had to be approved by. No, that's about the school. Oh, that's just the school. That's just the okay. school. Right. School has to, even though it's a community school, the Judaica faculty have to be approved by the uh, rabbi of the synagogue. Okay. Thank you. Right. OK, any other questions? Uh, any other questions? OK. So right now, uh, the seating capacity of the shul 
I, I would assume is around 600. Used to be 800. We used to have this beam up here, but now it's 600. Uh, they wanted to make more room, and they, we had carpets. They did away with the carpets. Um, they put in these, the, the uh, so actually it looks pretty nice, pretty nice. Uh, before we left, uh, the shul dedicated a Sefer Torah in, in my wife's and myself's honor. And so there's a Sefer Torah that uh, they use it in the, in the chapel. So now what I want to do, if you, ha if you are ready to do it, and that's to go downstairs. I'll show you pictures of all this history. And we'll go into chapel, too. I'll show you the picture of the rabbi who started uh, this synagogue. Thank you, Very good. Here's Ed Kronzberg, Hyman Repham. Right. This is the presence of the Beth Israel. Laura Sokol, Laura Fox. So here is the list of all the presidents uh, of Brishalom and the presidents of Beth Israel and that it combined. And here's the man, Rosenban. He was the president. He died shortly afterwards. Oh, you see this it? is Rabbi Hirsch, Tzvi Hirsch Levin. Oh, wait for people to yeah, come Yeah, wait in. just a minute until they all get in here. That reminds me of Hudson Levine. He used to be at Baron Hirsch in Memphis. Yeah. He wore that kind of hat. Which one? This is his book that he wrote, 47 pages, which I translated. It's in the all archives. Hebrew? No, all Hebrew. No, he, oh, Hebrew. Hebrew. All Hebrew. And he had the list of the people. That's why it's so important. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay, so mm -hmm. different. These are, this is the shul that they had in 1874. They built that building on St. Philip Street in 1874. Then they moved, uh, then they renovated that building and then they moved over here. Now this is the, the uh, Beth Israel building. Still standing. Still standing, right. This is Rabbi Aximum, the first uh, English speaking rabbi. He came in 1927. Yeah, but he still gave one, yes. ser one sermon a month a year. One sermon. Yeah. Right. 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 That was there in, uh, this was, this was in before 1954. Oh, excuse me. This exhibit was put up uh, in 19, uh, 1972. Uh, it was the 150th anniversary of this jewel. The Southern Jewish Historical Society had a convention in Charleston. It was their 100th anniversary, and it was a 250th anniversary of the Jewish community. And it drew a lot of people out of town. The last night we had some of these guys, Joe Wallace, and this was put together. This was done in the week. We've had the Jewish Jewish community. Okay. I saw my old rabbi from Savannah, Rabbi Rosenberg and his wife, in one of these pictures. Yes. Oh, he's a good friend of mine, Rabbi Rosenberg. Very good friend of mine. The home around the corner really is uh, very, very fine. This is the day school. That's the day school. When it was over here. This is when I was uh, installed. Hmm? That's me. Do you know anything? That's you. That's me. How do you like that? <laughs> How do you like that? That's you. That's me. This is my son's bar mitzvah. It was on Thanksgiving. That's my son Moshe. And this is our family. Yeah. That's my wife. That's correct. We went to school. We went to the University of Alabama together. She's the same age as I am. She was a freshman the same year. We went in 54. One of my twin sisters. I'm not one of their twins. 
probably in Alabama, Alabama it would have been in about 56. What was he done? I don't know what's the first year. This? This is taken in 1987. Wow. You have a beautiful family. Oh, that looks familiar. Yeah, that looks familiar. Yep. That's a great picture. That's a great picture. I saw that picture, Barbara said. Oh, yeah, it was young and thin. You're beautiful now. Don't worry about it. You're a lot thinner now than you were there. That's right. I'm like that at home. There's Tova. Right. Shoshi, Bensi, Vibra, Shira. Hani, who's just expecting a baby right. now, Rachel and Moshe. Now, he, she was just in Memphis, wasn't she? The one that's expecting. Yeah. Was she, yeah. I thought she did. Yeah. Picture of Tova. Sure. There's Tova. It's my daughter Tova. She's adorable. She's got a good press agent. You know Desi Sewell. Yeah. Desi talks about these things. Really? We all do. Yeah. She's my Desi's my cousin. Oh, she's a cousin. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And those are all your children. These are all my, yeah, seven children here. That was in our house where we lived there. And this is the bar mitzvah of my son Moshe. Thanksgiving. Every one of them is gorgeous. Yep. The boys and the girls. Well, look who they face. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, yes, I did mean to say that, I know why Trump was. That's right. They were really. That's right. That's right. I taught it here. Now it's at the rabbi's office. This is the rabbi's office. This is the shul office. This is the mikveh. The mikveh was also built by Rabbi Rabinovich, 1956. And they, it's the well-used mikveh. This is the oldest Ashkenazic Orthodox shul in America. Still used, yes, this, this shul. I mean, this organization, not the building, etc. Okay, so this is the Daily Minion, right here. Well, are you from Kalashin? No, no, no. My, this, I mean, this is my husband's family. We yeah. found an Albert Fox in New Orleans that we could put milk. Oh, really? Okay, so this is the Daily Minion. And they have a Minion every morning, every evening, 365 days a year. At Shabbos, it's upstairs. Here they have at uh, Mincha, that, that room they also have a Shalashudas on Shabbos afternoon. And so women don't come to the Daily Minion here? Yeah, they're, 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 you can. Sure, you can. <laughs> women do come. Okay, good. Sure. I've seen an overflow. That's it. Yeah. Okay, any questions? Is everybody here? Did we lose anybody? Uh, David's yeah, out front waiting for the cab. Oh, and where? Okay. And uh, be able to take care of the lady before she left, or not taking? She's coming. I think it's too long. Oh, she's taking. Oh, but you got that paper, the very yeah. poor paper. Okay, very good.